So the lectionary uh, suggestion for today, and for disciples it's always a suggestion, we don't have to follow it, but it takes out three verses from this reading from Luke. There are, there's the parable of the lost sheep, and then a parable of a lost coin that we know, or a widow searches for a coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. And I would assume that every suggestion uh, chooses to omit that, perhaps simply for saving time, giving Russell at least three less verses to read out of that very long reading. Um, but perhaps it could also be because that parable of the lost coin could be said to be the least applicable of the three to the ways that we can become lost to God. Okay, we're going to unpack that a little bit. In, in both the parable of the lost sheep and the prodigal son, the lost one has somehow strayed away. Right? A lost coin doesn't become lost because the coin itself has somehow run away or intentionally hidden itself. It can only become lost because of carelessness, if you will, of the owner, I guess, unless it were stolen. Right? And here's a great truth that might explain why that little three-verse parable was omitted from our readings today. God doesn't misplace anyone. God doesn't misplace anyone. When we realize that we have become lost, it's not because God has lost track of us. The God whose eye is on the sparrow isn't careless about anything or anyone. And so while the parable of the lost coin is useful to help us understand the great joy all of heaven feels when a lost soul is found, something of great value to God, it's not quite as useful in helping us to reflect on how it is that we actually become lost in the first place. We are, after all, not inert objects that God puts places and then forgets somehow. We are creatures with agency and free will, and part of that free will includes our ability to lose ourselves to hide ourselves away. We are free to make choices that can cause us to become estranged from God, or to at least feel that we are estranged from God. And although God never loses track of us, we are lost to God because of the broken connection that choices that we have made create. We don't know the specifics of how the lost sheep became separated from the flock. But anyone who's ever spent any time with sheep will tell you there are a great many ways that sheep can become distracted or fearful or just simply wander off. And how painful must it be for God, for Christ, our shepherd, to watch as we distractedly wander away or foolishly stay behind, or slip and fall because we're not watching our footing, or perhaps greedily reach a little too far for a tempting patch of grass that's really beyond our reach, or perhaps we stubbornly stay on an old pathway when our shepherd leads the rest of the flock on a newer, safer path. Or maybe we'll become and we mistakenly run away from the rest of the flock rather than stay there in that safer heart of God's family. Or even when we simply take our eyes too long off of the shepherd, letting our focus slip away and stay too long on something foolish, not really worthwhile. And then when we finally look around, we realize that we've lost track of the movement of the flock. We've lost track of our leader. And we find ourselves alone and vulnerable, frightened and lost. And it must be painful for God. It must be painful for Christ 
to know that that's where we've gotten ourselves. However it is that we've lost ourselves from our shepherd, the shepherd has never given up hope of finding us again. And God will go out time and time again, out from the gathering of the obedient, out from the flock of the safe and secure, to call for that lost one. God is not content then to simply sit in the midst of the gatherings of the faithful and comfortably bask in the glow of our worship and praise. Christ won't be satisfied with simply preserving the safety of us reliable, the, ret the attentive ones, right? who consistently will regroup within the fold of the church. Jesus goes out repeatedly and calls out to the lost ones. He goes out into the places that we can become lost and trapped. He goes out to those places that would distract us and that would cause us to lose our footing into wild and dangerous places that smarter, more obedient sheep would never dream of going. And he calls to us out there, or he calls to them out there. In the hopes that that lost sheep might hear his voice and realize where it was that they went astray and how it is that they can find their way back into the safety of his care once again. Jesus teaches these three parables about the lost being found in response to grumbling Pharisees. And they are grumbling because Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. Aren't we glad that he did? Aren't we glad that he does? still, lest we make the mistake that the Pharisees are accused of making, we have to remind ourselves none of us is perfect. Your pastor's very aware that he's not perfect. None of us then deserve to commune with God. We can't clean ourselves up enough to deserve to commune with God. So when we're honest with ourselves, aren't we glad that Jesus doesn't simply sit down with truly righteous and pure himself and welcomes back time and time again clumsy and fallen and dirty riffraff like us? The final and the longest of the trio of parables that Jesus gives in response to those grumbling Pharisees is really a gem of a parable, that parable of the prodigal son, as it's become known, or as I like to call it, the parable of the forgiving father. This parable ups the stake for us, higher encourages us to admit that sometimes we don't simply wander away or distractedly lose our way when we become lost. The truth is that sometimes we actively and we defiantly lose our way. Sometimes we break God's heart by saying, I no longer want to be considered part of your family through our actions. We get tired of being obedient we get tired of serving the other children of God. We say, I want what's coming to me now. I want all of it now. We can become so impatient, we can become so self-focused that we say, in effect, you're dead to me, God. I'm no longer going to look to you for guidance. I'm no longer going to trust in you to provide for me in a timely fashion, giving me just my daily bread I want what's coming to me now, and I want to use it for my enjoyment. And when we 
do that, we can deny that we are part of a larger family with a role to play as part of that larger whole. And we declare ourselves free agents, if you will, saying that we're no longer going to be bound by the concerns for the well-being of the rest of the family. We're no longer going to be confined by that yoke of obedience to a parent. We want to live. We want to live large. We want to get the party started, if you will. And as painful as that must be for God, God lets us do just that. God has given us free will. God watches as we bundle up the gifts and the blessings that we've been given and walk out into the world to enjoy all of the pleasures, all of the activities that are available to us out there without a care for those that we've left behind. And boy, oh boy, what a party we can have out there in the world when we decide that we're just going to live for ourselves until we burn it all up, until we burn through all of those precious gifts that we've been endowed with. And the world will let us burn through it pretty quickly if we want to. And once we've spent it all, once we've used it all, once we've bet it all away or danced it all away or ate and drank it all away, if we've been really living for ourselves that whole time, we will find ourselves very alone when that money is gone. When we have nothing more to spend on them, those that we have been partying with are happy to go and find somebody else who can keep paying for the party. And then when it gets bad enough, when we get lonely enough, when we get hungry enough, and we have to finally at last ask, how did I get here? In that very low moment, we are given an opportunity to come to ourselves to come to ourself, to remember who it was we have always been meant to be. We have the opportunity and the chance to recognize the voice of our shepherd, who's been calling all along. We have the chance to remember that we always were meant to be part of a flock to remember we've always been meant to be part of a family, a brother or a sister to other brothers and sisters. And we are meant to be an obedient child to a loving parent. When we come to ourselves at last, we remember it was never supposed to be all fun and games for our own personal pleasure. It was always supposed to be about remaining in relationship with God and in relationship with others for the mutual benefit of all creation. When we come to ourselves, we remember that as part of the family of God, we always meant to use those gifts that we were endowed with to help others daily, but not merely to stake ourselves every day. When we at last come to ourselves, we have to admit that we have walked away from God and it's up to us to turn back again toward God. Not simply sit and wait as if we're some misplaced coin, we are of great value to God, and God will always wait for us to simply make that turn back toward God. Coming to ourselves is more than some self-realization. Coming to ourselves involves repentance, admitting our willful ways, and taking at least one corrective step 
back toward God. Coming to ourselves means a desire to reclaim for ourselves the identity as a child of God that we cast off before. And if you look at that image, here's the promise that should fill us with great joy and cause us to live in great hope. All that God has been waiting for is that turn back. Turn back towards God. All that our Heavenly Father or Mother has been waiting for is that rekindled desire in us to be part of the family again. And God waits and watches anxiously while we're out there in the world, living self-absorbed and self-pleasured lives. And the moment we come to ourselves, the moment we turn back, God comes running. of our hearts. We can't even get the word of our mouth before all of sees that turn, recognizes the repentance in our heart, and can't wait to be reunited with us. Thrilled that we've once again come to ourselves and we're ready once again to take up the family business of mutual care and nurture for the rest of our family and all of creation. So on this fourth Sunday of Lent, as we continue to do the preparatory inner work that is going to help us most fully appreciate the new day, the new life that will be celebrated on Easter morning, we have to remember that on most days, we church folk are a mixed bag. We've lost and found, if you will. May we remember that those grumbling Pharisees were really the most religious and the most de devout believers of their day. May we remember that we too can make the mistake of believing we finally arrived and we can look down on those who are still sinners. So may we all pay attention to all the ways that we can be like the older brother in this story, living by the rules out of a sense of entitled obligation rather than a sense of grateful and inclusive joy. May we never begrudge anyone that joyous celebration that God would have them enjoy at their coming to themselves at last and the resulting return to the loving embrace as a child of God. I want to share this quote from Pastor Justo L. Gonzalez. It's entitled, What If We Are the Pharisees? He wrote it for the Christian century. No matter how far we have strayed, God awaits us with open arms and a feast of welcome. We have experienced the joy of God welcoming us when we least deserved it. And for that, we must rejoice. But once we've experienced such welcome and rejoiced in it, we have to watch out for our tendency to stand with the never lost, to rely on our having been found. During Lent, it becomes quite easy to adopt such an attitude. It's a season when we examine ourselves, when we purify our lives, when we sacrifice our wants for the needs of others, and in general, we seek to become like the son who has always obeyed his father. When, we, when this happens, we must realize the parable speaks to us, not so much as the sinners who overhear it, but rather as the Pharisees and the scribes who resent Jesus' welcoming attitude toward those who are not as good as they are. Lent invites us to count ourselves continually among both groups as we seek to obey God in all things while also grounding our joy in the experience of being found. So let's not grumble. 
when Jesus receives and eats with sinners. Let's not grumble when he asks us to do the same on his behalf. Rather, let's rejoice that he does. Let's redouble our commitment to do the same. Let's fully come to ourselves, grateful for both the forgiveness that we have received and for the opportunity to offer such lavish, lavish forgiveness and restored relationships to others in return. On behalf of God, on behalf of our shepherd, on behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.